All right, welcome to my new thing, The Crossroads. Um, this is hopefully while I get to interview or chat to really um, various people who have written books and such things. And today, for the first time, I have Ambrosia. How are you? Hello. <laughs> All right, so Ambrosia wrote Ambrosia's Book of Witch Flight, which is an absolutely brilliant book. Um, if anybody wants to get into journey work, um, witch flight uh, and such things, this is an amazing book for a variety of reasons. Um, and I think one of them, which I'd like to start with, is the, you met, actually mentioned it in the beginning, is the aspect of UPG and verified personal gnosis which a lot of people shy away from usually. And yeah, yeah, and I think it's, you also mentioned it, I think it's something that a lot of people need to actually start bringing into the community, into writing and such. Um, the biggest problem is a lot of people kind of write about UPG and they don't say it's UPG. You have, which yeah. I think is brilliant. Yeah, how do you feel Thank about that? Um, so, you know, this book was very much a work of like kind of making a pact with a familiar spirit of mine. I don't really consider myself an academic, nor do I really want to like poise myself as an academic. Like I have some, you know, I think Kelden Mercury's uh, The Witch's Sabbath is a wonderful academic source if people are interested in a more academic approach to witch flight. And I think that Kobe Michael's The Poison Path is a wonderful, you know, academic work about using poisonous herbs in their practice. Um, but I'm not an academic. I'm just a witch. Mm. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm just a witch. And so when I started working with this familiar spirit that I was pacted with at our coven's ritual, and when she asked of me to write this book, like, I thought there must have been a, some sort of mistake. Surely, because... I'm not an author. Like, I've never written a book before. I've reviewed books, you know, and I like vlog and I do other stuff, but I'm not really an author. So I thought there had to have been some sort of mistake. And I mean, she really wanted me to write this book um, with, with her help. And in terms of like UPG, Unverified Personal Gnosis, um, I recently talked about this because I saw this on another content creator's channel where they were talking about UPG, SPG, mm. and um, VPG, as in like unverified personal gnosis, shared personal gnosis, and like verified personal gnosis. Um, and I think that unverified personal gnosis as a whole has kind of become like this boogeyman buzzword mm. because either people don't, disclose that it's UPG and they just try to make it out to be like this is verifiable fact historically or folklorically without disclosing that, which I don't agree with. And that's why I was very forthcoming in my book that this is not the butch the this is not the book of witch flight. This is my book of witch flight. Mm. And it's a hundred percent my own UPG. Um however since I've published it, because I released it um, on the Sabbath of the first harvest, so it's been just a little bit over a month now, I'm finding that many practitioners um, from my area, but also from even out of the country, it's actually, some of it is SPG. It's a shared personal gnosis. I'm not really sure what separates shared personal gnosis from verified. Like, I'm not sure if it's just the test of time, right? Like, does that, does that, make it verified because like i feel like shared personal gnosis is common amongst witches of the same tradition like if you're in a coven you're probably going to have shared personal gnosis with other witches you're practicing with mm -hmm. um but verified personal gnosis like what what makes it verified i don't know if i really even subscribe to that idea as a witch that's in like a neo tradition mm, that's, um that's usually i mean when we look at all those those various terms, we have the UPG, which is one person who goes and receives some certain information from spirits and then brings it back and discusses it. But then you find that a group of people will then go and experiment with that and 
also experience the same thing, get the same information. Then you have people in various places who are doing something which is completely disconnected and they all have the same experience. So we have this kind of going from one person and then going through, but we also have um, what's called MUS, M-U-S, uh, which is usually called made up okay. shit. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And I think I think we actually we tend to get a lot of that in uh, writing and such. Um, you know, people just making up a load of rubbish and just putting it out there and saying that it's you know. It well, depends. I think that comes from this too, right? And this is kind of my controversial opinion, but personally, as someone who reads occult literature. Um, it to me it it gets a little boring when I'm reading the same mm. books of just regurgitated information from the '90s, mm. right? Like Scott Cunningham, cool. You know what I mean? Cool. Raven Gramasi, wonderful, right? But do we need to keep regurgitating the exact same information mm. from the '90s? We're in 2023 at this current point in time. And I think that the modern witchcraft revival movement would benefit greatly, actually, from more witches putting out their own UPG and feeding into the revival movement through that, because that's how tradition and craft, in my opinion, is really going to to grow. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. Totally agree. Now... Um, concerning the actual information in your book, um, is this something you do personally or with your coven? Is it is it shared in that sense? It's definitely both. Mm. It's definitely both. Um, witch flight is something that I started doing in my personal practice before I even, honestly, before I even really knew I was a witch. I was flying. Mm. Um, I didn't know that or have that terminology at the time. But I believe that I was flying before I even knew mm. what flying was. Um, and as far as the coven goes, it is also something that we do um, ceremonially and like group practice, whether it be when we're in person um, for a Sabbath or a Sabbath, or um, even when we're not physically in person, but at the same anointed times. Mm. We've also had experience experiences of um, flying out to the same place for a similar intention and then kind of cataloging our experiences and then cross comparing mm. everyone's gnosis. Um, and for anyone who might be listening to this, if, if you have a group of friends or if you are in a coven, I highly recommend kind of treating witch flight also as like a psychic exercise because I think it can be really connecting for different practitioners to you know, maybe have like one main goal of like, let's meet up here in the hollowed woods, but like keep everything else kind of open-ended and just see what different practitioners experience and then put all of that gnosis together and see what overlaps. Cause I think that can be really powerful. Mm. And I think, I think what's actually really interesting also is how uh, all the, the various different ways we can actually approach this. Um, I mean, your approach is great. I love the the idea, the the use of the mirror, um, and the uh, was it the the forest wards, tree wards? Did I get that? Yeah, right? tree wards. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, uh, that's just... a very like Appalachian. The the tree mm. wards is something that I would I would love to see more. Um, which is make content on as well, but it's it's a very like Appalachian folkloric witch kind of notion of like sending your spirit through the through the tree wards. Yeah, it looks so. Um, but I was I was just thinking now. Um, I mean, this is going twenty twenty five years back, um, and this was very experimental at the state at that stage um, because we didn't have video like this. And I've spoken about it on my lives with that I do with Rev Kai, but we we were both brought into an online coven, um, and as I said, very experimental at the stage. We only really had email, so we used to yeah. we used to take these journeys. Um, we used to like immerse ourselves into the journey, and a ritual would take a week, you know. So it would be passing back and yeah. forth and experience it in the astral time and physical time at the same time. Um, it's just fascinating of all the different various ways we can approach the, the witch flight and the journey work, going to the Sabbaths, 
Um, yeah, that's amazing, I think. Um, and I really wanted to call it Witch Flight specifically um, because in my early 20s, I worked in a metaphysical store. Mm -hmm. um, and in my work at that metaphysical store, in order to kind of go from just retail worker to reader, they wanted us to take specific courses and classes. And one of the courses that we had to take in order to make that transition um, was by a very infamous person, more so I would say in like the, the Oracle card tarot community. Um, I won't name her name, but it goes something along, along the lines of virtue. Oh, yeah. um, and she no longer, you know, participates in that particular aspect. She's moved on to a different field. But astral travel, astral projection, shamanic journeying was something that in my early 20s, I just wanted to be a tarot reader. <laughs> but the metaphysical mm -hmm. store was like, no, you have to take these classes. And so I did. I did. And it, it caught my attention then, but I'm just not a new age practitioner. Um, and, you know, then and then also in the past couple years, when I've looked online at trying to find books out there from a more trad witch perspective, I couldn't find anything. Um, a lot of the books I was finding were more so from the new age perspective of astral travel. And personally, I'm not a new age practitioner. I mean, working with like chakras and crystals and white Jesus is not my practice. It's just not my practice. Um, and so I wanted to call it witch flight to separate it a little bit and give it more of a traditional witch flair mm. as opposed to calling it like astral travel. But I do think that witch flight and astral travel and astral projection, I won't speak on shamanic journeying because I don't feel like I'm qualified to, but I think that these terms are in a way synonymous, but I think that calling it witch flight gives it a specific perspective mm. that like my book is coming from, right? Because it's Ambrosia's book of witch flight. Mm. I'm not trying to act like it's the one and only book of witch flight or even an educational book. It's filled with my personal journal entries, my recipes, my prayers and rituals, and my library spiritual. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's the other. Uh, that's, the book's just interesting, but I think that's the other interesting aspect is the the actual worlds and the spirits that you've interact with. Um, now, I find a lot of people have this idea that there has to be one specific truth out there, and there yeah. cannot be. Um, I mean, the worlds yeah. you, you go to, the spirits you interact with are completely different to what I, 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 I experience, um, yet mm -hmm. I can go to your world and experience those spirits if I wish to. Um, and it doesn't make one better than the other or one more real than the other, it's just you know, it's five dimensional space, it's the astral world, it's immense, it's, it's you know, it's just never ending. So everybody can yeah. have different experiences, but at the same time, groups can have the same experience, which just makes it more real at the end of the day. Um, yeah. No, yeah. I actually, um, one of the, one of the, well, a couple of the um, witch Sabbath experiences I've had um, through sleep, through dreaming, <laughs> The, the one that actually sticks out the most is when I ended up at a house party. Um, it was just this huge big house of thousands of people. It was just like chock-a-block. Just everybody's just partying and drinking and taking drugs. And there was one guy who was like the leader. And that was the devil. Um, but it wasn't anything to do with the forest. It was a house party. <laughs> Which just makes it yeah. completely strange, yeah. Yeah. But your hallowed, hallowed woods are... Very familiar. I have to put it that way. Well, I was going to say, I feel like the hollowed woods in particular, um, through like our coven, even has has been something that like a lot of us would consider SPG, not just mm. UPG. Like maybe some witches out there have not encountered the hollowed woods, then that's mm. doesn't make anyone less of a witch necessarily. But there's quite a few witches I know who we've all encountered this hollowed wood um, and we've all encountered the witch council mm. yeah the hollowed wood is definitely one of those um, 
places that are, are quite familiar to a lot of witches, I think. Um, but I think what what we should also mention is that the the four worlds. Um, can I call them that? The four worlds. Um, the the gates, yeah. the the watchtowers and the gates, yeah. gate, gateways. Um, the names you used are not familiar, but no, actually no. Let me let me put this differently. The names are not may not be known to, to everybody, but the names feel familiar. If that makes yeah. sense. Um, yeah, yeah. I've I've gotten that same um, sort of feedback from it. I will say that the Hollywood Woods. Specifically, the way that I perceive it, if we were going to talk about world building, because I think that it, it's kind of helpful for those of you who are familiar with like Dungeons and Dragons, for us to kind of talk about it from that nerdy sort of world building perspective to kind of just put it in context. When I look at the other world, from what I've seen thus far, I see the hollowed woods very much as this place of spirit and this ever changing landscape of like different species of trees that wouldn't usually make sense to be in the same woodland um kind of as this swirling misty mass in the middle and then i see the watchtowers and the cardinal directions from the woods that then lead to the kingdoms and then and then the realms like the northern realm the eastern realm but then the kingdoms of those realms um like grydell asalia uh dokar mitney I see those as kingdoms, which the Watchtowers was something that I've only explored really in my personal practice um, in the past year. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we find it, I mean, when we, when we talk about the Watchtowers, um, you know, as being those guardian spirits and the actual places that we enter, the gateways that we enter through, um, we find it in not just in witchcraft, it's in ceremonial magic, it's in Freemasonry, it, it's, it, I mean, yeah. it extends way, way back. Um, so there's a, a lot of energy that's built up around that, that concept to begin with. So, yeah, no, I think it's great. Um, the uh, Liber Spiritus, loved it. Yeah. And I've got to say, there were, there, there were two in there, Whoopsie Daisy and Oopsie Daisy, I absolutely loved. They actually reminded me a lot of, yeah. of Vinegar Tom. Um, which was a familiar spirit from, I uh -huh. can't remember who now, uh, during the witch trials. But, uh, you know, yeah. they had all those, they, those, those types of names as well, so I love the names, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> I have to go talk to some of these spirits at some stage. Yeah. Um, all right, anything else you, you, you would like to mention? Um... I don't know, just that, like, I really hope that more, um, you know, witches, more trad witches really put their own UPG out there. I think it's really beneficial. And I know that it can be scary because of how people react to UPG sometimes. But I think it's really beneficial to, like, the modern witchcraft revival movement for more witches to be really putting their soul into their work and sharing it as a bard because I think that's how traditions are going to grow. Um, and without that, I think that we're going to just keep having literature of the same regurgitated work mm. over and over and over again. And that work is amazing, but how many times do we need to retell it? You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, I wasn't meaning on making these too long, so uh, I think... Uh... That's it. Um, oh, have you got the book, by the way? I forgot to ask you at the beginning. I do. <laughs> I do. Right here. All right, there we go. Uh, I think what and I'll do... And it's available on Amazon. It's available on Amazon. Okay, that's great. All right. Uh, what I'll do, I'll actually put a link to... Actually, send me all your links, and I'll put them in the description. Um, and I'll put a, a... Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. And I'm absolute honored pleasure. that you took the time to read my work and interview me. It's an absolute pleasure. It was a fantastic book and you're a lovely person. So, uh, Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Thank you for joining me and speaking to me and everybody else. Thank you for having me. All right. Pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. I'll see you next time. Bye.